just hit recording and make sure that that is working and <laughs> okay and also so yes Sakan you are muted and I'm going to mute because I'm not sure what's going on there and I will get confused if someone starts talking in my face. Um, we're three minutes to the hour so I'm technically a little bit early but as you guys probably already all noticed um, I've been excited about the fact that today is the 320th anniversary of the great tsunami earthquake and tsunami of 1700 and I'm sure you all know exactly what I'm talking about because you all have been my friends for a while. So, Sakan, the what we're doing today is I am randomly deciding to remember what day it is and giving a quick lecture on my favorite topic of all time, the orphan tsunami of 1700. Or more accurately, the Cascadia subduction zone in general as told through the story of the book, The Orphan Tsunami of 1700 by Atwater et al. I am that kind of nerd. Okay, so for a little bit of context with how I have approached this topic, I just posted in Discord a link that I very much hope will work for you guys. I'm not sure if it will. You might need to have a ArcGIS online login to see it, but I kind of thought that I made it visible to the public back when I had the ability to do so. So click on that link if you would if you are so in inclined because okay so that is a story map that I made um yeah last two winters ago Jesus it has a lot of really important visual aids that I collected together um that I'm going to copy and paste into discord as I go through this and a lot of other information and then it turns into a speculative writing project um at the bottom oh it works yay it makes me happy um, yeah, so when I was a student at OSU, I was incredibly obsessed with this topic. Part of why I went to OSU in the first place was because I was obsessed with this topic. And I'm still obsessed with this topic, even though now I'm attempting to be a hobby podcaster instead of a geographer, because <laughs> I don't know, whatever. Um, so a little bit of context. Pacific Northwest is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire. So we've got subduction, earthquakes, volcanoes, the whole bit. If you've ever listened to me talk about anything, you've heard about this. There is very specifically this thing called the subduction, Cascadia subduction zone. I cannot save that image. Gosh darn it. All right, well, I guess you guys can see the map so you get to look at the map and that will be where all my stuff is. Um. Sakan is asking, is this the basis for the movie San Andreas in which the rock runs around and manages to leap in or out of or with every single motorized vehicle known to mankind while everything explodes? No. In a word. No. Um, there is... Okay. They are related in the sense that subduction along the coast of North America is helps drive both of those processes but the San Andreas fault is a side-to-side -side, um, earthquake thing so it creates a lot of sideways shaking a lot of very shallow earthquakes um, whereas up here in the Pacific Northwest you have subduction which is creating a very up and down sort of earthquake and they're much deeper the duration of the earthquake shaking will be different um, the kinds of waves that are rocking things apart are different but they are both related to the fact that North America, the North American continental plate and the Pacific, various Pacific oceanic plates are crashing into each other. Yes. So the reason that I'm doing this, despite not having planned for it or having really, I came up with doing this this morning um, because I remembered that this is the 320th anniversary of the last time that the Cascadia subduction zone uh, erupted. Ripped. Ripped is kind of more the word. Erupted is not a super helpful term because that implies volcanoes and there are no volcanoes here. Um, 
I mean, yes, I could rant about this literally any day. It's like, God, I love it. I'm a nerd. I will go off on it at the drop of a hat. But it is the 320th anniversary of this event. And so that makes it extremely relevant to talk about. So I'm going to basically walk us through a book called The Orphan Tsunami of 1700, Japanese Clues to a Parent Earthquake in North America. It's written by Brian Atwater, David Yamaguchi, and a bunch of other people um, on both sides of the Pacific. So there's several Japanese researchers as well as several United States researchers who brought this story together because it's a really intensely cool story about um, natural disasters, obviously, as well as geological sleuthing. It's a really good detective story. And when I say book, I mean uh, official academic paper that got bound into a hard book that I maybe kind of sort of purchased in hardcover from the University of Washington because that was a thing. It is... Where's the note for it. I have this cool citation. There's actually a government paper number that I almost had memorized once upon a time. Um, so this was published in 2015, so it's pretty recent. I think of it as being like an older paper, but um, it actually was published in 2015. Well, okay, let me, sorry. This edition with this cover was published in 2015. The original, uh, paper was published in 2005 and I'm holding the second edition. Yes, it is professional paper 1707 in case anybody wants to know that. Um, an electronic version of the book and updates to it can be found for free at pubs.usgs.gov. Um, I will actually very quickly go drop a link for that. because you literally can read the whole thing for free. It's only if you um, want to own it in hard copy, you'll have to pay for printing. But if you go to this link that I'm about to drop down here, you can read the entire thing in its entirety or in parts. Um, it's broken up into some nice chapters, but I just kind of want to go through it um, in its entirety and talk to you guys about all the parts of it. I know less about some parts than others. I'm pretty ignorant of more than the general scope of what the Japan side of the story is. I really have only paid attention to a half to a th two thirds of really the geologic side of this stuff. But Brian Atwater is a researcher from, he's a dendrochronologist, if I recall correctly, from University of Washington. And he came up with a lot of the initial science for this stuff and then ended up teaming up with um, some Japanese researchers to put together some clues to put this whole story together. So this is a super disorganized stump in our guys. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> literally doing this off the top of my head. I should be editing something else, but I need to spread the science. So I'm just going to kind of go through this book and let that guide me as far as how I can talk about this to you guys. And my uh, pop screen is in my way. Okay. So first we're going to go over Cascadia as a geographic region and look at the geologic signs of the fact that there are giant earthquakes in this part of the world. Part two of the book looks at the Japan side old Japanese writings that talked about an orphan tsunami that fucked everything up with no accompanying earthquake. And then part three is about the efforts to put those two disparate pieces of information together to come up with this story that we have down to the time of day. So let's just start with a moment of silence for all the people who lost their lives and their livelihoods and everything else that was dear to them 320 years ago today. January 26th, 19... Jesus, I can do words. January 26th, 1700, 9 p.m. It was dark. It was cold. It was rainy. There are Native Americans 
telling stories and cuddling up with their puppers and just kind of waiting out the winter, as you do in the Pacific Northwest. Anyone who's ever lived in the Pacific Northwest can tell you 9 p.m. in late January is just dark and cold and wet, almost certainly. So you're hanging out in your longhouse in, uh, I don't know, somewhere on the eastern side of the coast range in Oregon somewhere. No, not in the coast range. Not on the eastern side, western side. I've never done the anthropology for this properly. But imagine you're hanging out. It's raining outside. You can hear a storm going, but, you know, whatever. Maybe you can hear the ocean far off in the distance. Because for some reason you haven't retreated all the way inland. You and your family are chilling out. Maybe you're on the side of the Puget Sound. And then the ground starts to rumble and shake. Weird groaning noises that you never have heard in your entire life. And suddenly the ground is moving, it's shaking, it's bouncing you up and down. Things start falling over. You hear trees whipping and cracking outside. The fire tries to jump out of the fire pit. The next five minutes are the longest five minutes of your entire life probably feels like an eternity, at least an hour. And then it stops. Still dark, still raining. You're looking around wondering what the fuck. You and your family, your friends are looking around, what the fuck. Some people probably got injured when things fell over on them. Everything's fine, right? You're putting stuff away, wondering you know, who the hell pissed off, you know, the dwarves in the mountain or whatever, trying to come up with some explanation for why this would have happened. And then the world becomes ocean. And your entire village is completely swept away. Your canoe is chucked up into a tree, won't be found for three days. Your campfire is swept under sand, won't be found for 300 years. Only a few people who happened to not be in the house at the time survive. And they tell stories. They keep telling those stories and their children remember those stories and their children's children remember those stories about the time that Thunderbird and Whale got in an argument Maybe Thunderbird tried to pick up Whale and throw him to the ground to win the fight that way. Maybe they were actually working together and thought that the people would be able to get through famine if the ocean brought food to them. Maybe they were just wrestling and having a good time. Either way, from Northern California all the way up into Southern Canada, 700 miles of chaos was unleashed on the Native American population in 1700. That's kind of the stage that I want you to think about. That is what happened. About 9, 12 hours later, there's someone trying to deliver some rice off of a ship into a port in Japan. It's a perfectly normal day. You're just a trader. This is what you do. You get rice from one port, you bring it to another port. Normal shit. Sometimes there's, you know, storms or whatever that get in the way. But today, the port is chaos. Early in the hours of the morning, a tsunami just rolled through out of nowhere. Water pulls out of the, of the port and then comes flooding back in much, much higher than it had been normally and throws everything into chaos, rips the pilings off their, rips the decks off their pilings, tosses around boats that were at anchor, washes some of the, you know, houses into the ocean and you can't deliver your rice. And it's annoying because you're going to be the one on the hook for paying for that if it doesn't get transported in time. Where the fuck did that wave come from? There was no earthquake. Everyone knows that earthquakes make tsunamis. Why is there a tsunami without an earthquake? 
So that was kind of the state of what happened, right? This is the earthquake. This is the tsunami. This is the setup to this book that I'm going to attempt to flip through with you guys. But I just love trying to pull that human story into it. It's, oh man, I just, I live in the Pacific Northwest. Every time I think about late January at 9 p.m., I'm like, that would be the worst time, the worst time to have a natural disaster. And we have all of those little bits of story that I was telling you guys. I've read all of that in the various oral traditions of the Native American tribes in this part of the world. They all have these stories for that entire 700 mile stretch. Some of the stories even include a generational count that perfectly matches the years. I don't have them all memorized because I'm not an anthropologist or anything. But nonetheless, there's some very profound art, very beautiful stories. Um, if you look at that story map that I posted earlier, if you scroll down, um, I forget to exactly where, there is some pictures of art from the Seattle area that depicts Thunderbird and Whale. It's a very, <laughs> I mean, the names themselves just tell you, like, these are big forces, right? So they had the stories, but, you know, they didn't have the um, natural science understanding to give it any more context than that. Also, I should just discuss why do we care? We care because it's going to happen again. This is not the only time that this happened. <laughs> this has happened many, many times, and it will happen again. And like I said, guys, I'm super disorganized on this because I didn't plan to do this today. Um, so I'm just going to kind of read through this. Um, if any of you guys remember the earthquake in 2004, the Boxing Day tsunami, earthquake and tsunami, very similar geologic underpinnings. Same kind of idea. Obviously a lot more people <laughs> were involved because a different part of the world, different fault, but same kind of idea. And that earthquake, as well as the 2011 Tohoku quake, are both very prescient warnings about what we need to be thinking about here in the Pacific Northwest. So get into part one <laughs> after it's been 17 minutes. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. So there are these, one of the first pieces of evidence that we had on the West Coast of the United States is ghost forests. And ghost forests are basically trees that all died at the same time <laughs> because they suddenly were in salt water instead of fresh water. Now trees tend to not grow in salt water unless they are capable of continuing to grow in salt water. And salt water tends to encroach slowly enough that the forest will retreat, the trees will die at different ages, stuff like that. But there are several ghost forests where the, all the trees died in the exact same period of time. So you have to have something much more catastrophic that would have come in and made that change. And you can explain this with, let's try to discuss it the way that this book discusses it. So the land lowers to sea level or sea level comes up to the land. But like I said, if sea level comes up, it's going to come up slowly enough that the forest is going to retreat and die a little bit more incrementally. But if the land drops really radically, there you go. So as the plates are coming together, you get uplift on the edge. This raises the soil up or raises the earth up. Um, I think I described this in a previous Stumpinar, but if you put your hands together, uh, fingertip to fingertip, and you push inward, you'll notice that your knuckles want to come bulging up, right? That's a natural tendency. So the earth is doing that. It's bending up. It's bunching up. 
And this takes, you know, thousands, hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. So you can do things like have proper ecosystems encroach onto that ridge, right? You can have soil build up, you can have trees colonize in, you know, it's cool. Then that tension releases. And you, your knuckles in this metaphor go back down. So that land goes back down. So now the trees are much, much closer or even below the sea level that they were growing at. This has happened a lot of times. There's several instances of these. There are other reasons why you can get ghost forests. Uh, rapid increase in sea level, um, rapid change in climate. There are exceptions to how this could happen. This is not the only way you get a ghost forest, but nonetheless... You do get ghost forests when this process happens, and there are several of them on the coast. Um, also, there's a lot of really well-preserved marshes uh, along the Oregon coast that should not have been preserved by slow incremental sea level rise. That would have been like, that's a marsh, and then it's a little bit more salty, a little bit more waves, you get more storm surges, it would get destroyed, right? But if that salt marsh is 10 feet above sea level and then drops 15 feet and now is 15 feet below sea level, you're going to have a really rapid burial and get a really well-preserved salt marsh or really well-preserved marsh, which is great for various archaeological purposes, right? So there's a lot of really interesting preserved stuff along the coast that comes from this rapid change in sea level. You also get sand sheets. Uh, where the tsunami brings in this massive amount of sand and drops it off, and that sand is sandwiched between layers of fine mud. Um, I've actually seen these in person, and OSU is unveiling a new uh, Marine Corps lab, I think, in like two days, two or three days, maybe it's just tomorrow, or shit, maybe it's today. Somewhere this week, OSU is opening up a new marine sediment uh, core lab and they're going to have like a big public unveiling and they have all of these um, sediment cores from around the world and they also have a whole bunch of ice cores uh, we have one of the major ice core researcher researchers uh, here at OSU who's done a fuck ton of the work on that topic and we have a lot of the ice cores here but last year when I was still in school I got to go see one of the cores from the coast that shows the sand and it's just I mean, it's it's just mud and sand, okay? It's just mud and sand. But you're looking along and it's mud, 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 a little bit of grass, mud, 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 sand. Mud, 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 mud. Like, it is bright, big grains. Uh, this is very golden white sort of sand quality. Um, I'm very familiar with it because I spent a lot of time in the coast range and in rivers in the coast range. And I was looking at this core and it just, it's, so obvious what that sand is. I know that sand. I have gone running around in it at the Oregon Dunes National Park many, many times. And it's just there in this bright half inch thick layer in the middle of a whole bunch of mud. And if you know anything about anything, that makes no sense from a slow deposition standpoint, right? Different size of grains, different quality of materials. What the hell's going on there? Well, Tsunami comes in and brings a fuck ton of sand from the ocean with all of that force and drops it off. And then, you know, there's no more tsunami after the event. So go back to mud. Even if, like I said, you know, you might have the, the change in the ocean or might, the change in the land height. It's going to change maybe if it's, you know, a marsh versus a delta versus actually in the, you know, below sea level, you know, or whatever. Um, there's a lot of changes that go on there, but the point is you have this very out of place deposition that does not match what came before or after. And again, you find that all up and down the 700 mile stretch of the Cascadia subduction zone. Super important. Um, we also, so in some cases, in some sites, I was watching a very cool, oh, I should link that to you guys. Hold on. I'm going to find you a link real quick from YouTube. Um, there is a really, really cool 
Uh, so Central Washington University. First of all, it's just a cool university in general. Um, all right, great Pacific. But they have this one geologist called Mark Zentner. Nick Zentner. I can say names. And, yeah, stop playing. And he gives these really cool talks at Central Washington University. And my husband and I just the other day watched this one called Great Earthquakes of the Pacific Northwest. And I'm dropping the link in here for you guys right now. It's like an hour long, so don't necessarily think you can watch it right now. But I totally encourage you to watch it later and other videos that he's made because they're awesome. He's an excellent lecturer and, like, I want to be him when I grow up, basically. Um, why was I bringing him up? I was talking about sand sheets. I was talking about sand sheets. Oh, right. In that video, he talks about how in some locations you can actually see the successive tsunami waves because there's multiple waves um, per tsunami event because it's sloshing, basically, right? It's not just one wave. And according to him, at some of these sites, you can actually see in the sand grating multiple waves from a single event, which is amazing. Um, anyway, I highly recommend you watch this stuff. Um, so then the book is talking about how we can see a lot of these parallels in Chilean earthquake and tsunami. So just kind of confirming that a lot of these ideas are not just hypotheses based around the Cascadia subduction zone, it's also something that we can observe in other analogous environments like Chilean earthquakes because, you know, subduction along the west coast of the Americas, it's a thing. So, where are we going next? Um, okay, more discussing of... Salt marshes and preservation, like uh, Kakel said, um, it's really good for preservation. There's some, uh, I've got pictures in this book here of a basket or a wo some sort of woven item that was found in really good preservation. It was really well preserved um, because, yeah, just buried in the sand and mud of one of these events. Don't know if the person survived, but their handiwork survived pretty well. Uh, there's some pretty cool pictures in here that show soil layer, tidal mud, sand. Um, yeah, it's just some really cool field pictures here. Um, what else does the book have for evidence? Okay, we also have uh, these trippy things called sand dikes. Um, maybe you've heard of this before. Sometimes when there's an earthquake, you'll end up with a really radical change in the uh, pressure in the water in the ground or in the sediments. So you can end up with actual like sand geysers and little like sand volcanoes kind of um, erupting up out of the ground. I'm pretty sure I saw pictures of this happening Oh, I forget where, but I remember reading about this a couple years ago, people being shocked by actually observing it. These things tend to be preserved in the archae in the geologic record as well. Sometimes you can find these strange, you know, cracks in the ground that are filled with sand and it's like, what, how is thing? And it's because the sand was forced through it because hydraulic changes in response to earthquakes. Um, we've also got these cool things called turbidites. In the geologic record, which is basically a underwater landslide of debris. And this is another thing that he talks about in the Great Earthquakes of the Pacific Northwest video, is that you can find these all up and down the 700 mile stretch. You can find 19 of these motherfuckers all up and down that are the same age, the same kind of chaos. So there's a you know, there's some academic disputes about exactly what it means, how old is it aged, blah, blah, blah. But point is, there's very strong evidence for several times that this area has shaken itself all to pieces and all of these underwater canyons have, you know, created a landslide, just like you would have a landslide on, on, the, on the surface, right? So it's another thing about the whole late January thing, right, is that if it's a rainy January, like it usually is here in the Pacific Northwest, the landslide factor is going to go up so much. If you have those hills all full of 
water saturated soil and then you shake them for five minutes how many of those hillsides do you think are going to slough off their layers of mud and trees and bury the unsuspecting people and rivers and whatnot down below that's going to happen a whole lot so also happens in the ocean because there's tons of um old river channels that cut down to the um edge of the continent from you know when the um you know, during the last glacial maximum sea levels were a lot lower the rivers flowed out a lot farther um into the ocean well into what becomes the ocean and those channels are still uh carrying debris because they're still connected to the river right so they get off a lot of debris and then there's an earthquake and it all goes sliding down and creates a very specific kind of swirly chaotic mess that you can see in the geologic record i've actually seen some of these they've since become proper rocks lithified and been uplifted onto the coast where you can see them at the surface and it's a very swirly chaotic turbulent sort of you know you think of rocks as being these even graded beds or at the very least these wavy even lines turbidites are just chaos there's boulders and sand and swirly patterns of mud and every other thing in them they're just pure turbulence it's beautiful gorgeous stuff so moving on um here's a bunch of stuff about dating these events so the dating for these events is pretty precise because there's so much uh recently grown organic material preserved in them again we're only talking about um in this particular case we're only talking about 300 years even with the older cases we're still talking about spans of only several thousands of years so you get some pretty precise radiocarbon dating on the plants that were buried at the time which is pretty cool um, another thing is with the ghost forests this was one of the things that david yamaguchi did was he was able to get tree rings from the trees that had died 300 some odd years ago and was able to use that to narrow in the dates farther and because of the time of year when the trees died he was able to tell the time of year the trees died because of the way that trees put on bark for part of the year and not for the rest of the year um from that they were able to narrow down to within like a three month time span just from the dendrochronology which is pretty freaking cool so you've got scientists over here being like why do we have ghost forests why do we have these sand sheets is there a hazard of earthquakes here because there's a couple of pieces of evidence but not a history of it right like europeans had never experienced a radical earthquake here we certainly weren't asking the few native americans that were left if they would mind sharing their cultural history of disasters while we were wiping them out with smallpox and shoving them onto reservations that was not a conversation that was happening but geologists are looking around going like huh there's things here that only makes sense with earthquakes but we have no evidence of earthquakes other than these weird mysterious loose ends what the fuck so for reasons that i can't quite remember the conversation gets started with some guys in japan and this is the part of the book that i have not read quite as much um so i'm just going to read the first paragraph of this section because like I said, I've really only paid superficial attention to this part of the story because I just know the important part, which is where it ties into the geology. Um, quoting from the book. A Pacific tsunami flooded Japanese shores in January 1700. The waters drove villagers to high ground, damaged salt kilns and fishing shacks, drowned patties and crops, ascended a castle moat, entered a government storehouse, washed away more than a dozen buildings, and spread flames that consumed 20 more return flows contributed to a nautical accident that sank tons of rice and killed two sailors samurai magistrates issued rice to afflicted villages and requested lumber for those left homeless the village headman received no advance warning from an earthquake he wondered what to call the waves and that then is tied to an illustration from the village of miho where it's an illustration of the damage that was suffered and the village headman had written down his thoughts on the event and was like with the orphan tsunami bro but slightly more eloquent because it was the 1700s and he was the japanese 
Um, so part two of this book in general has six stories, six main Japanese villages or towns that recorded the tsunami. And as far as I can tell, a whole bunch of this portion has to do with understanding what those people meant at the time, translating the characters from the way Japanese was written down at that time to the way it's being understood now, uh, understanding how those locations have changed over time, getting the calendars to align. This is a lot of stuff that is much more human geography than I am really have ever paid much attention to. And I am not going to attempt to explain it all, but I know that there's a lot of, a lot of like Japanese historians were part of this project because understanding what they meant in a way that makes sense with our contemporary understanding of the geography of where towns are located, of what the calendar date was. There's like a whole fields of research that go into making that sort of conversion happen. And I am not qualified to discuss that. Oh, I just caught a paragraph with my brain. Aside from the 1700 event, no tsunami of remote origin is known to have damaged Edo period Kuwagaski. Hmm. So yeah, not a whole lot of orphan tsunamis in this period is what I'm gathering from that. Um, here's a interesting cutaway section. Sorry, guys, this is going to be awkward silence, but there's just so much interesting stuff to read here. In each of the primary accounts, the orphan tsunami has a different alias. So we've got some different ways that they described it. Tsunami, high tide, high waves, tsunami question mark, unusual seas. So each village did not have a sense of, oh yes, we know what this phenomena is. We're going to coordinate with the other villages to make sure they're all equally labeled. Like this was a detective story of going through records and trying to find mention that might be relevant to this. This was not like a Wikipedia search to see if there's supporting literature. This was like some hardcore Gandalf and his pipe in the ancient library, like finding the data sort of vibes, finding the history sort of vibes. From all of that, they were able to estimate the wave height, which is helpful, right? You have to know how high the wave was in order to estimate what kind of earthquake would have generated it. Um, one of the things that I've read about with respect to the Tohoku quake in 2011 is that part of the reason why Fukushima got overrun with seawater was because they had seawalls built to protect from tsunami, but there was an underwater landslide triggered by the earthquake that then added extra displacement to the water column near Fukushima. And that is why the wave overtopped the seawall was because there was a compounding factor adding on top of what the earthquake would have produced. From what I read, and this is back in like 2011, 2012, when I was obsessed with this, um, what I recall was that the tsunami wave would have been protected or would have not made it over that wall. And the reason that the wave made it over was because there was extra displacement. So... This is the promise and peril of engineering. You can engineer whatever the fuck you want, but you don't actually know everything that's going to happen. So, you know, trust your engineering with a grain of salt because they were fine for the earthquake. They just didn't realize that there was going to be a landslide on top of that. Assuming that that's still true, I like I said, I haven't double checked that fact since I remember reading about it in the immediate aftermath of the event. So you can feel free to uh, double check me on that. So tsunami move across oceans, not instantaneously. They move at roughly the speed of an airliner. That's the rule of thumb metric that tends to get given when there's an earthquake on one side of the Pacific and you wonder how long is it going to get to the other side, about the same length as it would take for you to fly that distance. So I've got here on the pages a whole bunch of calendar and timepiece calculation stuff. So this one, in this case, took about 12 hours 
10. I can read numbers. 10 hours. That is what this book is proposing. And that is how we know that it was 9 p.m. on a, on that night. It was not 3 in the morning. It was not 3 in the afternoon. It was 9 p.m. And we know that because we know more or less when the waves arrived in Japan and we know how long it would have taken them to cover that distance. Also, nobody ever mentions Hawaii in this story, but I would assume that the Hawaiians, the native Hawaiians living there at the time were like, excuse me with the orphan tsunami. It probably killed several of them and damaged um, their homes and shores as well. I assume that they would have had just as much warning as Japan about it because the earthquake would have happened far, far away from where they're at. Maybe because they're ocean going people, they would have been more cognizant of the subtle changes in the ocean that meant an earthquake had happened. But presumably they suffered the same as Japan with the quintessential, oh, we see the ocean is retreating from the shores, everybody move inland. I've never ever read anything about the Hawaiian experience of this earthquake, but there's no way that they didn't have one. So now the, the book is talking about samurai scribes. Again, levels of anthropology that I don't really understand. Um, talks a little bit about how uh, Japan has understood how to deal with tsunami for centuries. Um, apparently where we have like where they have signs today saying, you know, get up here beyond this line in order to escape the tsunami. Like those in Japan, many of those signposts have been there for centuries and continue to be a relevant high water mark of, yes, if you can get past this signpost, you're going to be safe. That's still very true. Like they've known this for a long fucking time. Um, yeah. And just, just public service announcement, guys. If you are ever at the coast and the ocean starts to retreat, you book it inland while screaming at the top of your lungs that everyone around you needs to follow. Do not fucking wait. Do not go back. Do not linger. Move your ass inland. Now. Do not wait for an official warning. Do not wait to see what happens. Do not go see what is happening in the ocean. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Ever. And don't go back into the zone of death and destruction until there's been an all clear because multiple waves will come. Sorry, PSA. Um, okay. Next section is talking about estimating the tsunami size based on a bunch of historical examples. Looking at the actual geography of the towns. Um, I've got a little thing in here about how somebody uh, wrote down the wrong date in the original documentation and that had to get uh, corrected by the researchers going through saying, I think you wrote the wrong date down, bro. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, and then we've got it talking about tsunami that hit Japan over the years, all the different ones that have been hit without an earthquake and trying to tie that back to earthquakes on the other side of the Pacific. So again, Japan actually has dealt with this kind of a lot, but you know, it's just hard to be like, sometimes there's a giant wave that comes out of nowhere. Like we don't have an explanation for it. It's just a thing. But living at the edge of the Pacific Ocean as they do, they have been hit with these, you know, many, many times. And like the waves aren't often like civilization destroying the way that they're going to be, you know, next to the earthquake zone. So like, um, the Tohoku quake in 2011, um, here on the Oregon coast, we had damage from that. We had warning. We had, you know, about eight to 10 hours of warning, uh, for people to, you know, either take their ships out to sea or pull their stuff up out of the, the zone. And it was only like a, God, what was it? I don't remember the wave height, but it was significantly diminished by the time it got here. Nonetheless, it still managed to pretty much total the fishing 
fleet of, I believe, Gold Beach in Southern Oregon. And uh, Peter DeFazio, like, had to go get some federal relief funding or whatever to help them rebuild their fleet, if I recall correctly, because even a three foot tsunami or whatever it was by the time it got here um, was enough to really bash their shit around. And Gold Beach is like an itty bitty fishing town. So really didn't have a lot of resources to deal with that. Um, so, you know, when we have our Cascadia subduction zone tsunami, it's going to be, you know, 30, 40 feet or whatever of run up in Japan, it's going to be many fewer feet. So same in reverse when they have an earthquake that totally fucks their shit up, we get a mildly destructive wave over here because some energy is being discharged into the ocean, is being discharged into the bathymetry of the ocean floor. Um, it's not like there's no loss of energy, right? Like pushing that much water or that much energy across the ocean, you are going to disperse some of it, but not all of it. You'll still get fucked up. Fortunately, we don't have orphan tsunamis anymore because we do know when there are earthquakes, but it doesn't stop the tsunami from coming over and being a problem. Okay, so more stuff about... I'm just flipping through the pages where they're going into how they looked at all of the towns. Uh... The government response to the damage. Um, modern recognition of the 1700 tsunami in Japan began with a teacher's mimographed anthology of historical earthquakes. Oh, cool. Like I said, I haven't read this section very much. So, yeah, I guess some teacher was like, I want to look at all the things and was then like, Oh, so would have been looking at the earthquakes and then saying, here a tsunami that didn't have earthquakes would zifak. Murta is asking me to ignore if throwing off. <laughs> I'm not going to ignore you. I'm going to make you a big, giant part of this thing. Isn't there a risk in the Atlantic as well as from part of the Canary Islands sliding into the sea? I know not of what you speak, but I would not say that that's not true because I just don't pay much attention to Atlantic things. There is a spreading ridge in the Atlantic, but there is not an associated subduction zone on either the east or west side of that. Like the east coast of the USA is, um, or of North America is a trailing geologic edge so complicated explanation but essentially nothing exciting is happening there and as far as i know the same is true for europe and africa that spreading ridge is not associated with subduction on either side as far as i know i know nothing about the canary islands sliding into the sea or otherwise i don't think they're volcanic but volcanic is more like rising out of the sea than sliding into it anyway I don't know. You're throwing me off. I'm going to ignore you. Oh, they are volcanic? That's more like building up into the... Yeah, I'm ignoring you. <laughs> um, more estimates about tsunami size. Modern land level being adjusted for tectonic subsidence. So yes, another thing is a lot of times the evidence for these things um, moves relative to modern sea level, either because sea level changes or because um, there is tectonic, you know, subsidence or uplift. Like I was talking about with your the example of your hands pushing against each other. Um, these things can change where the ground is relative to the ocean level, which means that it's even harder to uh, correctly untangle how all of these things went together. So that's part of why the majority of this book is about untangling the archeological, anthropological, and geologic record. Um, yeah, more narrative descriptions from people that lived through it and dealt with the fallout, looking for food relief. Uh-huh, and here's the harbor certificate that verified the shipwreck, which, of course, I can't read because it's in old-school handwriting, much less being in Japanese. Um, but yeah, that's... Oh, here's a cool paragraph. The certificate begins by itemizing the loss of 470 bales of rice. 
<laughs> See what I'm saying? It's like, this is just boring ass accounting. This is, nobody is like, oh my God, it's a natural disaster. Wow. It's just, yeah, I couldn't deliver my rice. Like, here's my insurance claim. <laughs> Um, talking about the weather at the time, because of course people at the time were thinking, you know, maybe these waves came from a storm and it's possible that there was a storm at the time, which makes sense, right? Late January, Northern Hemisphere storms. It's a thing. Not at all surprising that there would be, it's a good argument. Like this wave came out of nowhere. Maybe there's like the mother of all storms out there and then it is stormy weather. So meh, but Still, that's just one of those that hypothesis makes more sense sort of things rather than it actually truly makes sense. Ooh, and then here's a whole bunch of screenshots that ooh, ooh, I have to show you guys this link. This this is an amazing link. Um uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so this is a video that you can watch while I talk to you about it. This video shows a simulation of the tsunami wave height propagating across the Pacific Ocean from the Cascadia earthquake. And so as you watch it, you can just see it's like a big rock, right? Gets dropped into the ocean and then creates all of these ripples. And you see it hitting places like Hawaii. You see these subsequent rings of ripples coming out. And you see along the whole coast, it's lighting up with the wave height. So red is for the highest waves. But you see it's going across the entire Pacific Ocean. Like it's all the way down into South America. It's super tall wave heights on Hawaii and all the other Pacific Islands. And it's rippling into, uh, like, behind island chains. It's getting into uh, more isolated bodies of water that have natural boundaries. Like, it's getting across. And then the whole ocean is just shimmering. And then it stops. The animation stops. And it shows you a compiled wave height thing. And if you look at that, it's this big, red, angry splooch that comes out from uh, North America and points a little bit north of Hawaii, kind of straight towards Indonesia. And if you were paying attention during the Tohoku quake, or the aftermath of the Tohoku quake, you will have seen a very, very, very similar image in more magenta colors pointed the other direction, coming from Japan at the United States. And I cannot fucking tell you how many people wanted to share that with information about isotope release from Fukushima. Stop. Wave height is not the same fucking thing as isotope concentration. It's just not. I don't care if it's in bright, shrieking magenta. It's still not radioactive. Ugh. The number of people who shared that. It just... <sighs> don't be that person. This is wave height. This image is fucking wave height. That's what's happening. Sorry, that really, really annoys me. I need, I need to get that off my chest. DT is asking, is there a way for them to have estimated the approximate scale of the earthquake from all the data? abso fucking lutely DT. Very much so. All kinds of inferences involving much more math than I can properly explain. But yes, there are many different ways of estimating the size of the earthquake from the damage that it caused. Okay, so now we're past that animation. What do I want to move into? Um, more of the documents from Miho talking about wave heights that were observed. More deconstructing ancient Japanese writing. Ancient. 300-year-old <laughs> Japanese writing. It's not ancient. Um, some pretty brutal pictures of modern tsunami the 1960s. Also, just a little side note, um, the woodblock print that people tend to associate with tsunami, that big, beautiful, crusting wave of doom, that's not of a tsunami. That's not what tsunami waves look like, except for on extremely shallow coasts where the wave stacks up super, super high. But um, those waves are not really of tsunami. They're more like of a storm. And it's a little unfortunate that that particular piece of art 
is so often associated with tsunami because it's a beautiful piece of art that does correctly depict a kind of wave, just not that kind of wave. A tsunami does not come rolling in like a cartoon C shape. It comes in like the tide. Like a tsunami is just the ocean comes in and then it just keeps coming in and keeps coming in and keeps coming in and keeps coming in and you know then it's 10 feet over your head and that sucks but it doesn't come in like a wave and yeah exactly hollywood is so much to blame for this but also things like i mean that wood block comes from way before hollywood and people just associate it because it's japanese and it's a wave clearly all waves are japanese and all tsunamis are like anyway the assumptions that people make when you conflagrate science and art. It's annoying. So, let's see. Talking more about computations of the waves. Talking about the 1960 Chilean tsunami. More documentation from around Japan that carried details. Um, wow. Wow. The tsunami probably reached heights of several meters in Shinjo, wherever that is. Oh no, all these maps are too close up. I don't know where Shinjo is, but apparently there were things of there were waves of several meters in height that were recorded at the time. Um, okay, and now we are on to part three of the book. God, I've been going for an hour, you guys. I've been incorrigible. Stop encouraging me. <laughs> Also, words. Words are hard. Okay, so we've got a really cool picture of um, a chunk of tree that was a victim of this uh, earthquake. One of the interesting things about these tree rings is that they all had to be gotten from the roots of the trees. Because as you can imagine, these trees dropped below the height that they could uh, exist at with respect to the water table. And so... They died and the trees themselves then all, you know, fell over and were driftwood or whatever. But the roots, the root balls, the stumps, those were preserved in the salt marsh, right? Because they're in a much more anaerobic environment. They're protected from the waves because it's in a marsh, so on and so forth. So the dude had to figure out how to get tree ring dendrochronologies from water-laden roots that were buried in these marshes. I, uh, read a really cool book that I need to read again called uh, The Next Tsunami by, I think her name is Bonnie Henderson. The subtitle is uh, Living on a Restless Coast. And I'm pretty sure it was that book. It was either that or Full Rip 9, but it was one of those two books um, where she talks about just the, the sheer physical effort and stench associated with going out into these marshes to get this data. Like, you have to dig around in a nasty ass uh, tidal marsh to find a chunk of tree root that is thick enough that there's still rings inside for you to get to. Like, it's pretty hardcore. You're like up to your, you know, hips in really sulfury mud being like, is this piece of dead tree the one that has the evidence? Like, that's a lot of work. So hats off to David Yamaguchi and his interns, undergrads, and comrades in arms uh, dealing with all of that. Let me read what's here. So 1996 is uh, when this story got put together and the pieces of data got to meet up and say, hey, yo, we are friends, or at least related. Um... And then the story just got better and better over the next few years. More evidence came to light because once you start putting it together, new things start coming up. Um, as they put all the story together, there was really not a lot of doubt. Just by process of elimination, there wasn't really any doubt that these two things could not be related. Like, they have to be related. There's no other earthquakes in that time period. There's no other orphan tsunamis in that time period. Like, they have to go together. And so, yeah, the um, the tree rings had dated it to between August of 1699 and May of 1700. So that's how they had it within that six-month period. Down to the year. Down to the freaking year. And then these records from Japan came in and said, here's the day. Here's the time. Which is just so cool. So cool. 
So yeah, um, talking about how the trees survived or didn't. Okay, so now here we are talking about the strength of the earthquake. The 1700 Cascadia earthquake probably attained a magnitude between 8.7 and 9.2. So that's why there's this book called The Full Rip 9. And 9.0 is kind of our our metric of what a giant ass earthquake would be. That's really about as bad as it gets. You can go higher up that scale, but that's just getting into minutia of logarithmic mathematical things that people argue about because geology and math, I don't know. Um, but yeah, 8.7 39.2, basically a 9.0 if you want to just go with back of the napkin, arm waving, stumping our spouting sorts of numbers. Um, let's see if they can give me a quick way of explaining why that's a thing. Do, 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 do. Um, basically everything that's been talked about, wave height, strength of the sand, how far inland the sand sheets went, stuff like that. Um, we have also good evidence for how this is working both from here and Japan in the form of GPS monitoring. Um, this is something you'll see if you watch the Great Pacifics of the Pacific Northwest video that I posted. If you look at that, he talks about how one of the really cool things about the very uncool Tohoku quake was that they had a lot of GPS trackers installed all over the relevant area and they'd been able to watch as they had been pushed inland and up over the last, you know, however many years since they'd been installed and then how they snapped down and out after the earthquake. Um, and we have those same trackers over here. And if you mirror them across the Pacific, it's, you know, a fairly eerie cross comparison because <laughs> we have GPS trackers that are moving inland and to the northeast and they move more dramatically the farther you get to the coast once you're over into eastern oregon there's only a few centimeters of motion whereas out on the coast you've got inches of motion um and we saw that in japan how that that tracks for the amount of uh, subsidence and spring back and all these things we're seeing that same build up over here on the pacific coast and or on the pacific northwest coast so it's like if there was any doubt that we're in a similar sort of hazard zone like that should clear it up um i don't have a picture here but i've seen some cool uh, maps of just showing the vectors like really crude maps inside scientific papers they're not meant for public presentation but it tells the story very clearly of like oh this tracker has moved many many feet since it was installed and this one has virtually not moved um where we're at is sort of rotating north and west while the whole continent is moving west it's very this is a level of tectonics i wish i had gotten to study um physics kind of scared me out of the geology program before I could really study this stuff um, in as much detail as I would like to. If I ever went back to school, which is highly unlikely, I would totally self-teach myself enough physics to, te to test into being able to take those classes. I need to be able to take physics so that I can learn about how tectonics works at a higher level than I do now. Um, but for now, just know that there is empirical evidence that the Pacific Coast is... Uh, going to experience this. There's empirical evidence that that strain is building up. Um, yeah, talking about how we can see the drowned forests all up and down here. And then we're starting to talk about the frequency of this. Um, these happen pretty irregularly. Or pretty regularly, depending on kind of what time scale you want to look at. You know, we're talking, and you know, how much error you want to accept. It could be a few centuries. It could be several dozen centuries between these events. This is something that people do not freaking understand about statistics. Um, a hundred year flood could happen every single year. It does not happen once every hundred years. A hundred year flood is, there is a 
one in a hundred chance of it happening in any given year. Same kind of principle with earthquakes, only it's even harder to say exactly what those odds are. Floods are a way more observable phenomena. They happen way more often for way more tangible reasons than earthquakes. So that makes it really hard to estimate these things. But um, you've got earthquakes in this part of the world going back dozens of times for many, many thousands of years. Um, let me read you this paragraph. For now, it is prudent to assume, simplistically, that the next great Cascadia earthquake has a 1 in 10 chance of occurring in the next 50 years and that it may attain magnitude 9. The 1 in 10 odds follow from an average interval of 500 years if the fault lacks memory of when it last broke. The magnitude 9 assumption leaves a margin of safety in case of lesser events. So what that's saying is that it's a reasonable bet for me to want to stay living here if I want to watch the damn thing happen. <laughs> a very fucked up desire of mine is that part of me is excited about this hazard. I should not be excited. It is wrong to be excited, but someone has to do it. So that's me, I guess. Um, also, note here that we might have a lesser earthquake. We are not in a binary state of no earthquake or a full rip nine. We could have a partial rip that's only a seven. Only Southern California could get sort of messed up, you know, or it could be the whole thing, or it could just be a small northern section that isn't a strong earthquake, but only hits Seattle and Seattle is fucked because it's on a bed of sediment that's going to totally rock and get way worse. There's so many factors here. We could have a small one, a short one, a big one, a long one. There's just so much we don't know. We can't predict that. We can predict the range of options. But we can't predict exactly what's going to happen. And a 1 in 10 chance in the next 50 years means that it could happen while I'm recording this. It could literally happen as I'm recording this. And this will be one of the like most epic pieces of audio sampling ever because it will be literally me experiencing the earthquake. Or I might be dead by the time this thing happens because it doesn't happen for another 120 years. I don't know. 1 in 10 chance in 50 years is no guarantee at all. I really hope it happens in my lifetime, though. It's got to happen eventually. Why can't I experience it after focusing on it so much? As far as how many there have been on this fault, um, it really depends on if you're talking about how big or how well documented or which piece of evidence are you looking at to justify the claim. Um, there's 19 turbidites you can find all up and down the thing, all up and down the coast. Uh, there's 50 that you can find that aren't associated necessarily with all the other ones. Um, this is saying that there's a full sequence telling of seven earthquakes in the past uh, 3,500 years. Um, geology, sedimentology, and stratigraphy specifically are really hard to do, I learned in that class, um, because you basically never get the entire record from one location. You have to get little snippets of the record from lots of locations and then splice them together based on commonalities between them. So say something like um, the tsunami sand we talked about earlier, or a better example actually would be ash from uh, Crater Lake, Mount Mazama. So Mount Mazama ash, which erupted about 7,000 years ago is a really, really good marker when you're looking around this region when you're trying to associate other things. So you get, you know, a couple of core samples from some different locations. They're at different depths from different environments, but you can find the same ash layer in all of them. So that means you can then line up those samples according to that ash layer. Use that as your alignment, and then you can see the more or less the whole record around that event. I had to do so many labs of that in my sedimentology and stratigraphy class. It sounds easy in principle, but oh my God, trying to actually do it, even with just lab data, much less the real world, it was really challenging. Um, so that's part of why all these numbers are so complicated and there's not a clear answer. And every time you ask the question, you get a slightly different set of parameters on how the answer is conditioned. Sedimentology is a fucking mess. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, but half the pieces are missing. 
So then looks like the rest of the book is the stuff that I really spent a lot of time focusing on in school, which is how do we prepare the Pacific Northwest to deal with this? What is the hazard we're going to be looking at? Based on historical evidence, what do we have to face? What do we need to engineer around? What is going to be good enough versus not good enough? Um, and that's a lot of what I focused on in my career at OSU was being able to articulate things that uh, city, state, federal governments should do, articulating what individuals should do. Um, thinking through that is really a lot of what I spent my energy on at school. And the simple answer is we need to stop spending money on fucking up the world with war and build the Northwest to be able to deal with a tsunami because earthquake and tsunami because um, fuck guys, we are not prepared. Everything's going to fall apart here. We are going to lose the critical energy infrastructure hub, which brings in most of the um, fuel and power for the Pacific Northwest through a port. It's like a six mile long section. Not even six miles. Yeah, six miles. Smaller than six miles. It's a very bad place to put all your eggs in one basket. Let's put it that way. Um, most of our buildings and bridges and tunnels and power grids, none of that was built with seismic hazards in mind. The retrofits that have happened are based on too conservative of numbers and too many corners being cut. Nobody institutionally is taking this seriously enough to have really made much of a difference in our infrastructure preparedness. Um, people like Peter DeFazio have done a lot of work trying to get a uh, early seismic warning system installed that basically is a bunch of pressure sensors along the coast that could notice an earthquake or tsunami happening and give 30 to 90 seconds of warning to places like hospitals and trains that they need to shut down and power down and stop. Um, that could be the difference in saving some lives, but that's about the best we've got right now. As we saw in 2011, even the best engineered society with all the money and all the practice can still get completely clusterfucked by one of these events. Um, but here we, we tend to do even less than that. You know, we're having a lot of fights in Portland right now about um, unreinforced masonry buildings where the city wants to mandate that you have to warn people that they're going into a seismically unsound building and the historically marginalized populations in Portland are saying, we're the ones living in all of these old buildings. We're the ones running businesses out of these old buildings. Only people with excessive, um, only people with a shit ton of resources are going to be able to compensate with these new rules. And it's totally unfair and discriminate, discriminatory for you to be fining us for living in these buildings or having businesses in these buildings. And it's like a super true like factor about institutional uh, power disparities and yet at the same time the bricks are still gonna fall <laughs> like regardless right like this is gonna be a hazard no matter what so it's a mess and if we had an absolute fuck ton of money we wouldn't even need that much political will we just need a fuck ton of money but lacking money and political will um we're we're pretty fucked up here if it happens anytime soon we're fucked but that's kind of my hope is that it won't happen soon a lot of my essays would end with if we have 50 years and i spend my whole career on doing this we could be in much much better shape if we had 50 years and a blank checkbook and i was in charge we'll be in much 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 better shape to deal with this probably will not have any of those things <laughs> um a lot of money, pretty unlikely. Me being in charge of things, pretty unlikely. It waiting 50 years precisely, pretty unlikely. Um, that one's pretty likely, actually. Um, so yeah, we don't... I'm not really sure how to fix the problem other than that everybody needs to individually do their part and advocate. You guys need to take all of my... Uh, all my rantings and take a few snippets away so that way you too can spread the good news <laughs> about how we can or cannot solve these things. Um, Abigail is asking if I could become Oregon's governor in 50 years. See, that would imply that I want a political position. And aside from it being handed to me with uh, no reservations, no, nah, I'm not going into politics. So, merp. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, I thank you all so much for showing up to listen to me rant because today is the 320th anniversary of a whole bunch of Native Americans being very, very unhappy with uh, what nature has chosen to throw at them. Because, yeah, I mean, just to get back to where I started this, where I was trying to t give you that sense of what life was like for those people um it's the next morning your home is gone half your family is gone your favorite canoe is lodged in a tree and that tree is currently bobbing around in the newly shaped harbor mouth or um river delta all your shit's gone and it's the middle of winter where are you gonna get more clothes where are you gonna get more bark for clothes where are you gonna get food all your food was in that building. What are you going to do? That was the reality for hundreds to thousands of people 320 years ago today. Thanks for listening, and I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>